So uh, welcome everybody to the inaugural podcast of uh, Venus Edge. Uh, and for this inaugural podcast, we thought we'd go to a place where many of us don't go to. Uh, the title of this podcast is Venus Wound Care, the best kept secret, secret or one big lie. And our panel uh, today is uh, Marlon Schul, who's a um, vein specialist, and he's now out of Alabama, the past president of the American Vein and Lymphatic Society. He's uh, done a lot of work on, on wounds and the um, basically the lack of care uh, uh, by vein people regarding, regarding wounds. Uh, we have John Lantis uh, from Mount Sinai West in uh, New York City, very well known in the, in the wound field. And then uh, Bill Marston, uh, from University of North Carolina. Uh, again, he is the one of the, in, he will be not this year, but the next time around, incoming president of the American Venus Forum. And I myself, your host, uh, Steve Elias, I too work in, in wounds as well. We have a wound center at our hospital right next to the uh, vein center. So um, let's start out, uh, you know, the, the, the title is the best kept secret or, or one big line. And I, let, let me ask you, Bill Marston, when you get paid to continue to do something, you continue to do something. So my question is, if we continue to pay the wound specialist to do something, they will continue to do something. Is that a problem or is it like, this is great, it's really helped manage venous wound patients? Well, this is a uh, consistent thing throughout medicine. As long as we continue to pay people to ablate veins, they'll ablate more and more veins on the same patient even. And if we pay for atherectomy, people will atherectomy things whether they need to or not. So there's no doubt that the, you know, it's a spectrum. There are wound physicians who are doing the right thing, providing great care keeping track of when they should refer for procedures, but there's many that are more driven by what they get paid to do. And we all have patients who spend, you know, years in wound clinics uh, before they ever get to us, but it works both ways. And uh, I think the fields are very parallel. Uh, the way we feel about uh, wound people is the way they feel about vein people. But if we can build bridges uh, where the good people get to work together, that's where we get the best care. Yeah, and, and that's been some of, some of the issue in the past. I mean, John, what, give us a little idea about what, what your setup is, so to speak, at uh, Mount Sinai, and, and have you broken this, this vicious cycle, as Bill said, on both ends of the spectrum uh, regarding you know, wound care that is due to vein disease, say? No, um, unfortunately, it's a hard cycle to break. Um, I think one of the things we do is since we're the vein people and, and the wound people are the same entity uh, where we are, there is a little bit more of trying to follow an algorithm that involves diagnosis, making sure that we're not doing venous procedures on patients who may have inflammatory processes. And we see that a lot. Um, we do have, of course, like a lot of academic places, we see a lot of folks who've been offered vein ablation and we're kind of like for that two millimeter vein, um, hmm, maybe you have something else going on. Yeah. So we try to be, you know, stick to very strict criteria, but still uh, we're like everybody else. We're paid to do procedures. I think when we choose, you know, tissue-based therapy, et cetera, we try to uh, choose therapies that are only used once uh, maybe, and then followed with a skin graft or something like that. So we do try to close wounds in as few procedures as possible. That's a statement, but we're still incentivized to, to do more procedures. Probably. We just try not to. It's hard. Yeah, no, I know that. And, and so, so Marlon, talk a little bit about, about some of the issues that, that you brought up in, in that you actually took it in the opposite direction, saying that there has not been enough being done to manage venous wounds? This goes to basically a, a, um, a look at the number of ablations per limb and then stratifying those patients that received ablations based upon their disease severity with the diagnosis codes. And that's inflammation, pain and swelling 
uh, versus those with leg ulcers. Those with leg ulcers uh, that had an intervention was the, the lowest intervention rate, whereas those with pain and swelling were the highest intervention rate. So there's a disconnect between those that are the most needy of care versus those who are actually getting the care. Now, there may be a lot of features involved in those decisions. Uh, maybe they're post-thrombotic limbs, you know, that's not classified when they've got a venous leg ulcer, uh, whether it's superficial reflux or not. All we were looking at is those patients with those diagnoses and ultimately whether or not they went on to have ablations, not necessarily the number with that particular study. Uh, the separate part of this, and this was the Improving Wisely, was actually looking at the metric. And the metric is the metric is the metric. It's the same in the Crawford study as the Baber study as in our study. And it, so there is utilization and overutilization, but uh, those that need services most commonly, I think, are impeded by barriers that this is not just in our country, it's also in the UK, a recent survey of people that uh, routinely see these patients uh, when they had the Everett trial, about a third of them said they could change their practice with early referral, whereas another uh, good third couldn't do anything because of structural barriers that were not going to allow them to refer patients early with a venous leg ulcer to care. And you touched on something, John, which I think is critical. Some of the claims-based uh, literature that's out there that says the number of um, ulcers in this study that were venous ulcers is 8% have to be wrong. Okay, there's no way that in a study of thousands of ulcer patients based on claims that they're getting an accurate diagnosis. So I think you hit it on the head. Some patients or some people, providers, I should say, that are uh, trying to do the best work they can may not be recognizing the signs and features of true venous reflux disease and venous uh, leg ulcers versus other conditions that have nothing to do with the veins. Yeah, I mean, Bill, in, in your wound center, what, what it, do you think is the percentage of venous wounds that are seen? Well, we see a, a large number of wounds that you might think are venous, but have negative studies. So their lymphedema, obesity, a lot of that stuff um, is probably only 30 to 40%. We have a healthy diabetic population. And so the, you know, the, the, the thing that works both ways is as a wound specialist, you're trying to figure out all the underlying etiologies and many times there are multiple versus as a vein specialist, you know, I'm trying to deal with the veins and you got to work them both together to have the best outcomes and, and figuring out, okay, this is a patient with venous disease who also has, you know, lupus or has rheumatoid arthritis, you know, they go together and you have to treat both. Yeah, I mean, John, would you say that, I mean, that, this is what I would agree with you, Bill, that in, in our sense, it's about 30 to 40% Mm -hmm. tend to be venous in, in nature. And, and that's what the literature says too, as opposed to Marlon, the, the data that you're saying in some other studies is much, much lower. Mm -hmm. but, but John, do you think that's about what you guys are seeing? Yeah, no, it is. Uh, it's what we're seeing. I think one of the things that happens though, all of us are interested in veins. And uh, I, when you look at some of the data that comes out of the outpatient wound care centers, the, the big for-profit entities uh, that exist out there, um, I think one of the things that happens is a lot of uh, venous ulcers are actually being treated by um, vascular surgeons who may not be in a wound care center. So I think one of the things is veins are underrepresented in uh, the global wound care center market, if you will, whereas their prevalence is higher than that data might suggest and that uh, vascular interventionalists, vascular surgeons, uh, vein specialists might be seeing a percentage of those that don't show up in that other data. But I would agree the data is the same. And as soon as we have a patient who has a, a ultrasound that doesn't make sense and they're not obese and their goniometry is you know, not terrible, we immediately are looking for inflammatory processes. And our hardest thing is finding any rheumatologists who are interested in partnering with us. Rheumatologists, you can't expect a rheumatologist to help you, John. But no, I, a question for you, though. Don't you think a lot of the wound clinics just underdiagnose venous disease? You know, they well, just I do. don't I think, recognize it. Right. Yeah, no, I just think they don't recognize it. You know, a little lateral ankle also. I mean, it's amazing and to me how many you go into one of these clinical trials and you want them to get good venous studies and they all exactly. say they can't get them. It's amazing. Yeah. That's critical. That's critical, actually. The diagnostic aspect that we have in our clinics far exceeds some of the diagnostics that are being done uh, at hospitals. Studies are being done looking for a deep system 
a problem, not a reflux study, for instance, and all they're doing may be, and this is just from experience for 18 years in a market, looking for a DVT. And if the DVT is not there, uh, well, then it's apparently not venous because these patients are studied in a supine uh, setting until they're, I won't go into the cases, but bottom line is that if there's early referral, it doesn't necessarily mean they're all going to get an ablation, but they sure as heck better get a good ultrasound, a standing ultrasound that can help identify whether this is a post-thrombotic limb, a superficial reflux limb, a lymphedematous limb, or an arterial uh, ulcer. If it's vascular, it should be sorted out in the clinical setting of a vein center. It should, it should happen. And uh, I would certainly hope that um, those diagnostics would, would be uh, better, but I, I, I hear you, Bill. If you're not getting a quality diagnostic test, then, then you know, how how are you going to differentiate these patients? So, so you know, the title of this is uh, "Venous Wound Care: The Best Kept Secret or One Big Lie." So, uh, let's talk about the, the the secret part of it, which Marlon, you kind of alluded to. I mean, John and Bill and and uh, Marlon to a lesser extent, because and and me to a lesser extent. You guys are involved with wound societies as well. You talk to them at time, you're asked to speak at their meetings and stuff. So, so why is the 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 marriage between veins and, and wounds, why has it not been consummated in the way that it that it should be? Um, what is the disconnect? What is this this secret that each is is keeping and they're not disclosing their secrets. Why I can tell you, Steve, every time I speak at a wound meeting, you know, when we talk about the procedures that we can do, uh, you know, even before I'm done, people are lining up for the, you know, after you're done with the talk question. And they're, they're all like, I don't know anyone in my town that, that does these procedures. Well, I know three people in your town that, that does these procedures, but I don't think the vein specialists are going to the wound clinics and trying to recruit their business. There's a lot of, you know, I just can't talk to the vascular specialist or the vein specialist. They're like, the, the, the people that work in the wound clinics are intimidated, I think. And, you know, many of them would like to refer patients, but they don't have a way to do it or they don't feel comfortable doing it. So, you know, uh, there's been a lot of interest in trying to build those bridges, but it's been really difficult. So what, what, yeah, John, how have you built bridges or? Well, I think again, we have, we're sort of in a, you know, in an odd New York City microcosm where we see, we, we see both parts of it. We see the wound patients come in, most patients come in with a wound and then we're diagnosing their venous disease. That's true. And many of them will have had an ultrasound somewhere. And as Marlon said, that, I think that's the big thing that's changed. I know Bill and I did a, a a study probably about 10 years ago now looking at venous disease and we could not get CAP data even prospectively trying to get the <laughs> CAP data and anatomy data um, because all these wound centers didn't have a good vascular lab and I really think it it makes a lot of sense when there are a vein center in almost every town now and a wound center in almost every town I mean, kind of uh, that there should be some real high level um, interaction between those to say this is the best because a vein center is going to be the best place probably to get a good quality diagnostic study. And then lastly, I'll just say that a lot of vein or a lot of wound specialists still think of venous disease as one, one type of ulcer and therefore one type of treatment. And they don't really think about poor calf muscle pump function. We can all lecture this all we want superficial or deep vena, they don't obstructive disease. They, they don't get the nuances of what they're going to have to do differently for each disease type. And they don't understand it's many diseases. Should now, John, John, let me ask you, do you think though that the vein clinic down the street from you, cause there's probably four or five, if you go a couple blocks, right? Do they really want your stinky, big venous leg ulcer legs in their clinic? I think Marlon already said that, right? They they don't. They're gonna go. They're gonna do and all that's the, the people problem. Have a lot. Yeah, right. They say they I, want to take care of these patients, but they don't. And this is the big problem on the vein side. A lot of these patients don't have great insurance, and you know, you don't want to put them in there next to your cosmetic practice, right? 
So how do we make this work out? Well, the way I think that's a generalization, guys. And I just don't think the people that have been doing this a long time are they if they're doing this a long time and they're serious about treating veins, then if they're not welcoming those ulcer patients, they're really missing the opportunity. If it's a true venous leg ulcer, it's hard to hurt them. You're going to likely make a friend for life. And so I believe that there needs to be more about partnerships with wound centers and having an understanding that, you know, you treat wounds all day, I treat veins all day. Uh, help, let us help you make a diagnosis and let's work together, see if we can't make these patients better more quickly. But, but Marlon, that's what I'm saying in this, in the, it's, it's like the best kept secret. Why wouldn't a vein specialist or a vein center want to make friends with a wound center because you're gonna get an enormous amount of patients coming there and wound patients in general need more procedures per patient than, than you know, a C2 patient. And, and I agree with you, Bill, they may not want the stinky wound in, in their office, but if they're smart, they can separate and all, I mean, it's the vein center wound center at, at Englewood Hospital where I work. And I'm, my office is right across from the hall from the, the head of the wound center. And essentially my deal is I don't want to take care of your wounds. Just let's identify the underlying venous pathology. I'll do the procedure and they go back to you. And I think if we can get that kind of uh, cooperation, everybody's happy. Look, None of us really like just picking at a wound. Most of us like, you know, doing something. John does. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, whatever, whatever makes you happy, John, enjoy, enjoy it. But that's kind of like, it's kind of like you got to pick at a venous wound for like a couple of weeks until you do a 30 minute procedure that's going to help the patient. You know, you got to spend a lot of time beforehand, you know, mm -hmm. doing it. It's the same thing with any vein patient. You spend more time talking to them uh, before and after the procedure than doing the procedure. It's the same, it's the same idea here. But no, what I'm saying is, why can't we like have this agreement? Why can't we say, it's, this is the Venus Edge podcast. Why can't we tell the vein specialists, get the edge, go out and talk to your uh, wound centers, tell them you just want to do the procedure. And you, mm -hmm. they go right back to you. What's wrong yeah. with that algorithm? I think that's what we'd like to see happen. And, you know, Bill Ennis were here. He would also say it's just been difficult to create those, um, you know, those sorts of bonds there. And this is what the people tell me when they come up to see me, that they don't feel comfortable approaching their, their uh, venous and vascular people around them. So I think it's more up to us on the vein side to, you know, Reach make the inroads. Them. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that could happen, and, and, and again, we're maybe in a bit of a unique situation, but you guys could comment on this, would be also a lot of times with a wound care center, when you had the business model put together, a lot of the ancillary stuff, is, you know, the hospital's happy because they're going to get more CAT scans, more MRIs, more this, more that. Um, but, um, you know, usually the vein centers are freestanding entities that aren't related to the hospital. And I think that sometimes there's probably, I bet more than sometimes, I bet a lot of times, there's sort of a, the management system of the wound care center doesn't look toward outwards to create those partnerships. And I think that might be the purpose of this podcast to some degree, if nothing else is to say, mm -hmm. uh, because the vein centers are looking in, right? They're looking the other direction. So since we're aimed at the venous practitioner, really, I think it, it's probably a little bit um, incumbent upon the vein practitioner to look towards the wound care center because the wound care centers just aren't set up that way. Just like Bill said, they're, they might be intimidated. They may not even know how to get there. And probably internally, a lot of them aren't, in, um, aren't sort of uh, supported in you know, looking outside their own institution. Uh, I just think those might be some of the endemic problems. Now, what, what do you think about this model that some of the, the larger wound, you know, organization, not, not societies, but, but um, you know, uh, private enterprises that have set up wound centers, 
that they're trying to bring in-house the treatment of their, uh, the diagnosis and the treatment of their uh, venous wound patients by having somebody associated with them make the diagnosis and do these procedures. Marlon, what do you think about that model? I wish Bill Ennis um, was on this call because I think he's got as much experience with this, uh, with theologics as anybody. He's done the experiment. And I don't believe that that's my place to comment. Um, if, it was, if it was something that could uh, take off and help these patients, we might actually see a dent in the incidence of venous leg ulcers. So on that side, if every, if every wound center provided ablation services and every vein center continued to treat ulcers as well, I think that we would really make a dent in the incidence of venous leg ulcers in this society. So I think it would be a good thing because we could use more providers to help those patients in need. Uh, how successful it could be, I, I, I think, and, and actually, um, Bill Marston was involved in, with that as well. Uh, Bill, do you want? Do you have any insight to that approach that was that was done uh, with Theologics? Um, I don't have like actual data to to tell you how it's going or anything. But my impression is that, like everything in medicine, it's always local, and it always comes down to the people. And I think it's always so interesting how parallel the vein and the wound worlds are. I mean. Practitioners come from a lot of different backgrounds and they can be successful um, from a lot of different backgrounds. And it just depends on how well they're trained and how conscientious they are. And, and it's the same for both worlds. So the, the, the challenge is getting somebody embedded into the wound clinic that's a skilled venous practitioner. I think it's hard to train people who are wound practitioners to be vein specialists and vice versa just because the, you know, the weekend stuff doesn't work all that well, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, you, Bill, uh, John Lantis and, and myself, we all work at a place where there's vein specialists embedded into the wound center. And for us in general, I think it works quite well for our patients, but the, the I agree with you, Bill Mars. The issue is trying to get a non-procedural person who has a background not being a proceduralist, who's working at a wound center to learn themselves how to do a interventional procedure is really, really tough. And, and somehow the wound centers need to find somebody that either can embed themselves or can align themselves. And, and I do think, John, as you said, we, we, meaning the vein people, have been a little bit remiss in really telling all the people that come to the various meetings we speak at, you really, really got to do this, not just because it's going to make you some more money, but because you're really, as Marlon said, these people are really, really happy. We all know this. You help a, a, a ulcer patient, they heal and they stay healed. They are like absolutely thrilled. It's like the greatest thing you could ever do for them. So, you know, I don't know if we've done our job is what, what you're saying. Um, if we wanted to do our job, Bill, Marcia, we'll start with you. What is the one or two data points we'd want to make to the wound specialist? What would be our, our elevator pitch to them, so to speak? Hey, we got this data and this data that says if we do this, this is what's going to happen to your venous wounds. Yeah, it's all the EVRA trial right now. I mean, before that, we really didn't have ammunition because they could say, oh, well, you know, it's not going to heal any quicker. We'll heal it and then we'll send it to you. But just by natural inertia, you know, a lot of time it didn't happen or the patient didn't want to go. Now it's all the ever trial. We can say, look, this needs to happen. You're going to have better outcomes. And, you know, if you ask the patient, they'd rather heal a month earlier. So that's the, the whole thing. And so that's it, Marlon. Do we have anything else? Any other data yet? I mean, that's that's kind of sad. You guys don't think that's kind of sad? We've been dealing, <laughs> we've been dealing with wounds. I mean, we we were Bill. You and I were at the uh, in in Hawaii. How many years ago now? To decrease venous ulcers by fifty percent in ten years. Yeah. Well, now we know that you can heal it quicker by doing the procedure, and you have less recurrence rates. Well, right. what more do you need to make these things go forward? You know, I mean, if a wound clinic came to me and said, "Hey, listen, 
come over every other Friday. We'll tee up four or five vein cases for you to do. We negotiate a rate for my time, but what's not to like? Right. So why, right. you know, why shouldn't a venous specialist do that? I think I one agree. of the other things you can point out is that uh, you can take like it for data that the wound specialists are more familiar with than the vein specialists, but you can take a look at the Carolyn Fife's data in regards to how many patients with venous leg ulcers actually get a diagnostic ultrasound, which is mm -hmm. unbelievably low. Yeah. And right. I, and that's another thing because of course you, I think there's also the reality that you want to point out, yes, we can do procedures for you, but we can also probably do a better diagnostic uh, ultrasound for you because theoretically you're certainly not, not every patient, as we've already said, not every patient who has an ankle ulcer is going to end up getting a procedure. Yeah, and that's what Marlon said about, you know, you, look, if you can't find the disease, if you can't do a good ultrasound, you can't treat the disease. Right. And, you know, that, that's, that's maybe where, where we start from. Let me, just two more things I want to ask you. One is, should the paradigm be changed? And, it, and I believe maybe it is in a little way with some, some, uh, some third-party payers. In other words, you give the wound center X number of dollars to take care of this patient. And then when they run out of it, when they run out of the dollars, they don't get anything more to take care of the patient. In other words, it is in their best interest to be as efficient as possible and to heal the wound as quickly as possible because they get the same amount of money whether they're sitting in there for six weeks or six months. Marlon, what do you think of that changing the paradigm? That's called... Uh value-based care. And if you've got a leg ulcer, you're going to get X number of dollars. And if you can't heal that ulcer in a period of time, then again, you've exhausted, you're still taking care of those patients, but you're not going to get any more. If you were, if you find, um, and this is, this is already uh, taking place in some markets. I, I, it's not in my market as of yet, but uh, if that is to happen, it's in the wound center's best interest to couple with a quality diagnostic center that can get you an accurate diagnosis, work on correcting the reflux, heal them what should be more quickly, everybody wins. Um, if that was to come to uh, fruition, I think that there would be a true shift in these alignments because it would be in, well, for once, it would be in the patient's best interest. John, what do you think about this? idea i think it's a i think it's a reasonable idea i think we'd unfortunately have to create some form of um of tier system though because there are patients whether they're massive venous leg ulcers the patient who's massively obese post phlebitic has an open ulcer and we might have to make structures where we recognize we may be managing that patient where they may need inpatient therapy uh that their veins need, you know, so I think there'd have to be a category where severity of the patient, disease, yeah, and the patient yeah. didn't, didn't fall in that category. I also think that uh, in that same category, though, the idea should be probably that you could actually say that in case, if you didn't have appropriate diagnostic imaging, you wouldn't get paid at all. I mean, I actually think that wouldn't be unreasonable in this day and age to say you needed to have a venous ultrasound that showed something or you had a, a reason for the disease because I still think too many people are treating the wrong thing. I mean, I'm just making bad diagnoses. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, it, 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 you see a patient and you need to get your diagnostic studies within a certain period of time. And if you don't, you don't get paid. Yeah. Um, so Bill, I don't want you to answer this question, Bill, but I want you to answer the next one, <laughs> which is, which is actually true in a way. I'm going to ask it of all of you. Bill, you are the king of veins and the king of wounds. And you can and you can decree whatever you want over the vein land and the wound land. So what would you, King Marston, decree to all the vein specialists and the wound specialists to get venous wounds managed in the best way possible? Well, I, I mean, I think the thing is to create the marriage. You know, you want the, the prince of the vein world to marry the princess of the wound world. But I mean, the, the bottom line is to do the things we talked about, which is to, I don't think you can home grow it. You can't grow it within one. I mean, most vein specialists 
really don't want to manage the wound. That's why they loved it when Raju would say, you don't have to. You know, you fix the iliac vein and it's just going to heal. I don't Imagine. even put a compression around. They loved it, but it didn't work. It right. doesn't work. You know, you got to do both. And so I think, you know, you got both sides. The thing is, is to, to take good care of your patients, find the people in your town that are doing the other and, and get together and just figure out how you're going to, you know, take care of these patients. It just works out. And, you know, it's going to benefit both of you as well as the patients, but it's a challenge to do because people just live in their worlds, you know, right. they don't, you know, but I would say we decree, they all have to go to a party and marry up, you know, <laughs> anyone have any other, anything else you would do as King? Uh, well, I would make sure that Bill Ennis attends his uh, designated phone calls. You're right. From now on, <laughs> we'll, we will do that. Well, he will be kicked out of the kingdom. That's right. Okay, we kick him out of the kingdom. So, um, yeah, what it all comes down to is everybody's got to talk to each other. Everybody, you got to find the people yeah. that, that, you know, and, but, but I really do think that we, as from the vein side, we really need to push this much more on our colleagues, that it is in their best interest. Look, money talks. It is their best interest. They will they will make more money if they make friends with their wound centers and educate. Right. Uh, there's, no, no, absolutely. there's no question about it. So if we can get them on the money side, that's that's good. Um, so I want to thank you guys for being the the inaugural Venus Edge uh, podcast. Uh, talking about the best kept secret or one big lie. We decided it's not one big lie. It's really the best kept secret. And we got to like let it out to the vein specialist and the uh, wound specialist. So uh, thank all of you. And uh, we hope everybody who was listening enjoyed it. And there'll be more to come. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Steve. Thanks a lot, Steve. Thanks, Thanks, have a great night, everybody. everybody.